this age, we don't lack male role models who have big muscles, but we definitely do lack male role models who are just like super masculine. Testosterone is very anabolic. It gives you big muscles. It makes you look masculine, but it doesn't actually necessarily make you act masculine, especially if it's not being converted into DHT. So you have guys, you know, they take stuff that kills their DHT to keep their hair from falling out, and then they take steroids often to then increase their muscles, make them more anabolic. And I think there's a definite connection there. I think the demonization of DHT goes hand in hand with the demonization of masculine qualities. It's all about looking masculine, not actually acting masculine. Hello and welcome to the Rejuvenate Podcast. I'm your host, Chrissy Hawks, and I am here with my co-host, creator and founder of Genetic Insights and Feel Younger, Elwyn Robinson. And today we are discussing sex and libido. So tell me, Elwyn, why did you want to discuss this topic today? Because we realized we still haven't got around to it as the honest answer. Um, it is also something that I'm very used to working on, if not talking about publicly, because you know one of my businesses that's been going for eight years now is all about helping men with uh, sex ability and sex drive and uh, even potency fertility stuff like that so it's something that i'm very much immersed in and i would say i'm not as much of an expert on uh women's issues but actually a lot of it is overlapped so it's true for both genders and i think i have a reasonable grasp <laughs> of women's to be able to talk about it today but i do plan to get an expert on who is you know especially an expert in uh, women's hormones and uh, women's reproductive uh, capacities and stuff like that, who has more of an expertise than me. But um, as I say, especially in this area of what I believe we're going to cover first in libido or desire, I think I have a really good grip of it for, for both genders. Because of course, when you get a lot of men contacting you and wanting help, they don't only want help with their own libido, they want help with their partner's libido as well. So it's come up a lot. And um you know, I do know stuff that can help. Wonderful. I'm, re I'm really excited about learning more about this and also being able to bring that to everybody. So first question, why do people want to have sex? <laughs> you know, what is it that makes desire happen? You know, is it a purely a biochemical neurotransmitter thing or is there more to it? So that's a good question. So that depends partly on your perspective on life, right? Like your philosophy, your religion, stuff like that. From a purely mechanistic scientific point of view, what they believe is that basically all life is about is survival and reproduction. And you could actually simplify even more to say just survival of the genes. So you're focused on your gene surviving through you and then also through you reproducing. Um, so that's the simple biological answer. So, you know, among certain you know species, they can do that without sex. Like, <laughs> you know, plants can sometimes have sex with themselves and all the rest of it. But Certainly for mammals, we need to have sex in order to reproduce. So it's an absolutely core drive. Um, now, of course, many of us engage in sex, and actually not only humans, but other animals, particularly mammals, who which doesn't lead to reproduction. So there is, of, and in fact cannot lead to reproduction. So there is of, obviously more to it than purely that, but that's like the purely mechanistic perspective. Before I comment on that, let me just talk about some of the other perspectives. Um, so, you know, one of the other uh, benefits of having sex, of course, is it's pleasurable. And this seems to be the way that nature has set it up, is that it has made it uh, pleasurable for us to do the things that it wants us to do, or maybe DNA, the things that DNA wants us to do. It rewards us with feel-good feelings. Um, from a more spiritual point of view you could say that people want to have sex because they want to experience a feeling of union or connection with another person or persons i guess um from a psychological point of view sometimes you know people are often attracted to people who remind them of someone from their past you know so there can be that motivation as well um, and then from a religious point of view, you know, often they look at it as like uh, a duty of um, not just bringing forth the next generation from a more mechanistic scientific point of view, but like if you believe that you are created in the image of God and that your God has told you to go forth and multiply or some version of that, then you're having sex, um, or at least you're telling yourself you're having sex. <laughs> because you're you know that's how you honor god right and 
there are some religions that actually, you know, still present in this earth right now who take that very seriously and, you know, aim to reproduce as much as possible from their point of view to honor God and to, you know, create more followers of that God in the world, which they consider to be a good thing. So there could be a few different reasons. The purely scientific materialist person would scoff at all of them other than the you know, survivor and reproduction reason, because they would say that's that's all that really drives us and all the rest is more just explanations that we give ourselves in our head or justifications or whatever. But, you know, the purely spiritual person would say that the material aspect of it is neither here nor there and it's, you know, all about really having this divine connection with other souls or whatever. So we can look at it from different perspectives. So then... Within that space of, okay, yeah, we're giving ourselves that justification. Now, going into that desire, and obviously we're going through puberty at certain ages, and then there's just all these hormones and things going on. Uh, from that physical space, is that what then brings it all forth, which is what makes us want to have sex? Yeah, I mean, this is a tricky one. Um, you know, some children do experience desire before, you know, they go through puberty. Um, usually that's for a very bad reason, to be honest, it's because they've had a, uh, you know, a abusive experience or maybe they've witnessed something that they shouldn't. Um, so there is more to sex, um, than, you know, purely that reproductive urge. Oh yeah. Let me just comment on that before we go on. Um, so, you know, there is also the pleasure aspect to it. And as I said, we're not actually the only animals that engage in sex that cannot possibly lead to. Uh, reproduction you know so you know various animals masturbate various animals have you know homosexual sex and and various other things so uh, we're not the only one who does that as to why we do that that's something that's not fully um i would say there's not been a final conclusion about that within the scientific world as to why i mean other than the simple fact of course that it's enjoyable for the uh, ones uh, doing it, but why nature would wire us to make it enjoyable to do these things that don't lead to reproduction, I don't think science has come up with a really definitive answer as to why that would be the case. And that would maybe lend a little bit credibility to, you know, a spiritual or religious or whatever perspective that there is more to it than pure physical reproduction, because if there weren't, why would there ever be this urge which doesn't lead to at least the potential of reproduction? So there is a little bit more to it. Um, it does seem to be that we've been given that ability to experience pleasure. But anyway, sorry, Chrissy, what was your next question? Yeah, no, it was just talking about that neurochemical, you know, biochemical neurotransmitter aspect of it. Like this flush is that, you know, well, I say flush, but you know, all of those, um, oh yeah, hormones or things that are coming in, you know, is that the big underlying reason of why we want to have sex yeah i mean not just hum uh, hormones but if you include you know neurochemicals neurotransmitters in that yes um if you uh, and the proof of that is if you alter someone's hormones and neurotransmitters enough they will have no desire to have sex so absolutely the desire to have sex is dependent on a certain combination of uh, neurotransmitters and hormones, which we'll go into. So, I mean, you hear the word libido. Can you just give us the, you know, what is it? <laughs> give us the, the definition here. <laughs> so, I believe it's as simple as sex drive or the drive to have sex. So, what you were talking about earlier, it's a desire to have sex. I think it's as simple as that. Um, sometimes it's also associated with other things like virility, um, meaning not just the desire to have sex, but also like the impetus to pursue sex or the impetus to make sex happen. So that's sometimes associated with libido as well. Like someone, if you say someone has a strong libido, then um, you are probably implying that they don't just want to have sex, but they're actively doing stuff to make that happen. <laughs> so that could be a part of it as well. But I believe technically it just means the drive. Okay. And then, I mean, I think this is, you know, one of the biggest reasons we're having this conversation today is that there are a lot of people out there who as they're aging, you know, their libido or their their sex, their desire to have sex decreases. So, you know, a couple of questions in here. One, why is that? And is it different for men and women or is it the same thing that causes that? That's a good question. No, it's very different for men and women. Um, remind me of that question about men and women. But first to answer that, I think to understand why our libido declines often with age, we actually have to understand what creates a libido in the first place um so let's talk about that a little bit 
So let's talk about what increases desire in the first place. What increases desire full stop ever, you know, for anything? Sex being just one example. So the number one thing that desire is dependent on, we talked about in other episodes, but this may be your first one, is dopamine. All right, dopamine is the molecule of desire. And specifically, dopamine is the move towards form of desire that we normally call desire. The reason I make that distinction is because your body can easily, with one chemical reaction, flip dopamine into noradrenaline. And noradrenaline is more a move away from or keep away from me kind of desire. So um, they're both motivators to action. But dopamine is kind of like moving forward, I want that. Whereas noradrenaline is kind of, I don't want that. That's really the distinction. I, you, you could technically say they're both forms of desire. Um, so dopamine is really the key. And so, you know, when we talk about hormones and stuff, as people do and as we will, we have to understand that any hormone that ultimately increases dopamine is going to increase sexual desire, along with every other type of desire any hormone that reduces dopamine is going to reduce desire. That's just the way that it works. That's the universal number one thing. And people focus a lot on other stuff, which they're not wrong to focus on, like, you know, testosterone, for instance. Uh, but understand that if tos testosterone had no effect on dopamine, it would have very little effect on sex drive, right? It has to happen through that, if that makes sense. Am I hearing that the testosterone does affect dopamine? Yeah, I'm saying if it didn't affect dopamine, it would have little impact on desire. Got it. Okay, yeah. It okay. must affect dopamine. It must. Okay. Now, a partner of dopamine that's not often thought about, but which I talk a lot about in this podcast, um, but which is very important as well, is oxytocin. So I didn't used to think that oxytocin was a sexual desire promoter because theoretically it makes you kind of feel fulfilled and satiated. And so then I thought the desire would go down. And in fact, desire for drugs, desire for foods, um, desire for a lot of addictive behavior can go down when you increase your oxytocin. And so I assumed that increasing oxytocin would reduce sexual desire. Turns out it's actually the exact opposite. And I think that in, in my experience um, and also looking at the literature. And so I think that actually what it is is that oxytocin is that um, desire to connect. And so that goes to that other aspect of sex that we just talked about. Sex isn't only about reproduction on an experiential level. It is also about uh, creating a bond or a connection with someone. And in fact, some of the criticisms of, you know, what's happened in the last 60-ish years or so, which I think are valid, is that by treating sex as if it's a purely material, physical act, um, you know, that's uh, only around reproduction or even only around pleasure, we're denying how big an impact it has on us, right? Like there's no such thing as casual sex. Um, it actually forms a bond. And, you know, one of the criticisms of too much casual sex is that people lose that ability to pair bond. They lose that ability to really form deep, intimate, uh, trusting, loving connections with people if they have sex too often. A lot of people say that's more true for women than men, but I certainly believe it is true for both genders to one degree or another. Um, and so oxytocin, I do think, is another big part of that sexual desire because it is that desire to connect. And on a very practical level, it increases blood flow to the genitals, you know, via a um, nitric oxide mechanism. Um, and it increases the heart rate, which is that kind of feeling of excitement. So, you know, on a kind of very practical level as well, it corresponds to a lot of those feelings of excitement um, and desire. So I don't think oxytocin on its own would necessarily lead to a high sex drive, but I think oxytocin added to dopamine really takes it to the next level because the, you kind of hit your limit with dopamine and desire. That's why people who, who take dop dopamine drugs like methamphetamine they often lose sexual, or not necessarily lose sexual desire, but they, yeah, eventually they do lose that sexual desire, even if the dopamine is high. So it's not only dopamine. Yeah, because I mean, remember in previous episodes, we talked about how dopamine is um, rate limiting or rate limited by the body because it tends to use up some of our very, very essential resources. So, you know, the body is um, 
frugal. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah, okay, but yeah, okay. in the case of someone like on methamphetamine, especially, which is really the most dopaminergic of all the drugs, so people feel very motivated and driven, you know, unless before they get to that point of severe downregulation. Um, but they're not necessarily got a super high sex drive, although that does sometimes happen. So I think that the variable there is the oxytocin, you know, like if there's oxytocin there, then maybe they have amazing sex and huge drive. But if the oxytocin isn't there, often they're completely off you know, on their own <laughs> meth head tangent and the sex doesn't even occur to them, right? So I do think oxytocin is that other key part of it. Um, and so that's kind of in the area of neurotransmitters. O oxytocin is also a neurotransmitter. Um, and then in the area of like pure hormones, the ones that really increase desire are, uh, yeah, testosterone, uh, but actually more powerfully, and we've talked about this previously, DHT, uh, dehydrotestosterone, which is the much more androgenic form of testosterone. So testosterone is more anabolic, which is why, you know, bodybuilders, people on steroids, people want to get big muscles, testosterone is your thing. But if you actually want to experience maximum sexual desire, DHT is really where it's at. Um, and that's because DHT has an even more powerful ability to hit um, that dopamine receptor. Um, as well as GABA, which then, what's the word, um, as a side effect, will also increase that oxytocin. DHT is very androgenic, meaning uh, masculine uh, qualities. Qualities, exactly. Right. So it's not something I would personally, or a woman would personally want to take in high amounts because it would have. Unless you would like to become a man because you think. Right. Well, like you are more of a man inside. Um, it's interesting. I was just speaking to someone who I plan to be interviewing at some point who provides people with DHT um, and he's spoken with a lot of people. And he said, you know, he obviously supplies it to a lot of men. He supplies it to people uh, who would like to become a man. But he also supplies it um, to women. And he said if DHT is applied specifically on the clitoris, then it can increase the sexual desire significantly. So... His perspective is if you apply it very locally to the area that increases sexual desire, it's not necessarily going to have a systemic effect and make you grow a beard and all the things that you don't want to have. So that was new to me. I'm not certain about that. I haven't seen the research on that. That was merely uh, his experience. But yeah, other than that, maybe generally DHT is not something that you're going to want to have. Now, testosterone might be. And one of the classic things that women are often given when they go and see bioidentical hormone doctors in their you know late 30s 40s and beyond um often se low sex drive is one of the things they experience along with other, not, a bunch of other stuff and you know we'll talk about that soon uh, and testosterone is often given to them and in a smaller amount than you give to men but still some and it still works and from my perspective it probably wouldn't work if some of it wasn't converted to dht so I do actually believe that there is a place for DHT with women. It's just less than with men, that's all. But it, it still has that libido increasing effect. Um, the last one on my little list here of uh, sexual desire might surprise you. Um, and it's actually estrogen. So now estrogen does not have a dopaminergic type of desire element to it. Meaning, remember I said earlier about dopamine is I want that and then noradrenaline is like, I don't want that. So estrogen is actually, I'm open to that. <laughs> so estrogen is more related to uh, what they call sexual receptivity than uh, sexual drive or sexual pursuit. So what you'll find is um, someone, let's say a woman who's very high estrogen but very low T, she will be probably fairly happy to have sex, but she probably won't be able to have an orgasm. So she's receptive to having sex, but she doesn't have that excitement that would lead to an orgasm, which the testosterone would relate to. Um, funnily enough, um, the combination that's most likely to mean a man doesn't have erectile dysfunction is actually high testosterone and also fairly high estrogen. When a man has high testosterone but really low estrogen, he's actually much more likely to have um, erectile dysfunction. And it's, I believe it's understood to be for a similar reason because it's related to that receptiveness to sex. So estrogen is not desirable. We've talked about that a lot in other uh, episodes, 
but I'm just saying that if you reduce your estrogen too much and then you start to have a you know less of a sex drive or less sexual re receptivity then and and this is why you know originally back in the you know 50 years ago ish when they were doing hormone replacement for women they were giving estrogen when they went for the menopause you know this one of the side effects would be the sex drive crash it was a bit more of a misogynistic society back then so that was you know one of the focuses and so if you give women a lot of estrogen their sexual receptivity will return to some degree now they're still not going to feel great if you don't also give them progesterone and they're still not going to have that drive if you don't give them testosterone but it's just saying again that although i'm not a fan of estrogen i think it is implicated with the bad type of cell mutation and and all the bad stuff we've talked about before everything is like there's a level of it that you you know don't want to go over it but there's also a level you don't want to go under it's very rare that you know the less the better and so yeah estrogen not that you want to have it as high as possible which is kind of true for the other four things i said but you want to be aware it is a ingredient that if it's completely lacking you could still be low in desire it has its place for sure within the mix. Absolutely. So then are there things that reduce the libido? Yeah. And in fact, I should have qualified that a bit with uh, like increased desire as well. So general health and vitality and energy will increase desire. General ill health, lack of vitality, inflammation, a low energy state, all of that stuff will reduce desire. So I could have put like T3 thyroid hormone in the increased desire category, um, but it's more just like a general health thing. That's why I didn't like put it in there. Um, but yeah, so anything that's bad for your health will reduce desire. But very specifically, there's a few things that um, very specifically reduce desire, even if you know you're otherwise generally healthy. Uh, one is prolactin. So. Prolactin is a hormone that uh, poses dopamine. So meaning when prolactin is elevated, um, it shows that you have low dopamine because prolactin is easy to measure with blood tests and dopamine is not. So generally prolactin is what is measured. Uh, in order to deal with high prolactin, what they usually do is give you some kind of dopaminergic drug, not amphetamine necessarily, but something actually not a million miles away from that um because they are antagonistic to each other basically you never have them both high you never have them both low maybe not never hardly ever so there's always exceptions but um so basically if you have high prolactin you will almost certainly have low sex drive now what that's one of the things that is um different for men than women is that men when they orgasm their prolactin goes up for a real period of time so that's why it's a lot more difficult for a man to be multi-orgasmic with a woman. Not that I'm saying it's impossible, but it's much less likely because of that tendency for the prolactin to go up. However, high prolactin is libido suppressing for both men and women pretty much equally. Okay, a couple of things. What would cause uh, somebody generally to have high prolactin? And then also if a man or is having sex a lot... Uh, and his prolactin's going up, could that be the cause of, you know, of the prolactin staying up? Yeah. Like if a man is having sex several times a day or masturbating several times, basically if they're uh, orgasming several times a day, then they could be in a state of chronically elevated prolactin. It should only be up, you know, for a few hours. But yeah, if you're doing it a few times a day, that's a few hours at a time, um, then it can keep it high. And I do think that is one of the things about, you know, uh, pornography addiction is it makes men especially, but I think it's two to one men to women, so you know, women as well. It makes them, you know, uh, hyper aroused, overly aroused, and then they're orgasming too much. Men will have more of a physical consequence for that, that then that gets their prolactin to be chronically high, their dopamine starts to get chronically low. Um, as to what causes high prolactin, so general ill health is the obvious answer again. Uh, inflammation and stuff like that it tends to go high along with high estrogen um, it tends to go high along with cortisol along with adrenaline and along with noradrenaline so generally with stress chemicals and inflammation also thyroid deficiency so if you're hypothyroid even you know mildly hypothyroid suboptimally hypothyroid 
that can be a thing that uh, makes prolactin go high as well. Um, and exertion does it. But, you know, they talk about that as if it's a separate thing from stress, but I, I really see that as part of stress. The point is, any stress will raise prolactin, even positive stress. So getting in the cold plunge pool, you know, uh, doing a sauna, whatever, right? So any stress will at least temporarily raise it. And if, But if you're chronically stressed, then it will be chronically elevated. And this is where people get into that state that we've talked about before, where you haven't collapsed yet, but life is just a struggle. It's not a joy anymore. So what that means is you have high cortisol, you have high adrenaline, and you have high prolactin, which means you have low dopamine, which means you don't have that drive and also that enjoyment anymore. Right. Okay. Very, very good point. So is prolactin the only thing that can, um, you know, make your libido go down or are there other things? A couple of other things. So another one is serotonin. So we talked about serotonin before, used to be thought of as a good thing. These days, the tide's turning on that a little bit in the mainstream. The tide's very much turning on that in certain areas of the alternative world that I inhabit of health. Um, but it's pretty much um, very well known that things that raise serotonin, like, you know, specifically classes of drugs, well, not always, because they work through several different mechanisms and it's a bit idiosyncratic, but they will very often really flatline the person's libido. What can be said about high serotonin, my perspective on it, is people say it's calming or relaxing or happy making. I think all of that's true if the alternative is like panic or terror. So... In like uh, or, or a really uh, acute pain. Like a while ago, I had my tooth pulled out and I had a dry socket, it's called, uh, which is just like a really painful thing that lasts a couple of weeks and there's nothing you can do about it. I'm sure during that time, my serotonin would have been elevated because I didn't want to be present in my body, feeling that pain to full intensity. So it was really it would have been really good, and it was really good to the degree it's true, to have something that just kind of numbed me, just put me into kind of fluffy world of everything being less intense. You know, like the, the volume turned down, the color, the saturation turned down on life, you know? And that's exactly what serotonin does. And that's why some people have an issue with, you know, drugs that raise serotonin because they say, you know, they feel emotionally flat, they feel emotionally dead, they feel, you know, like numb you know everything's boring or like like it's far away disassociated all that kind of stuff so that's what serotonin is for i definitely do consider serotonin a stress chemical but it's a stress chemical in the sense that um it helps you to psychologically survive being in an unpleasant experience uh, and that's very valuable funnily enough the next on my list here endorphins is actually the same thing or you know, your endogenous opiates. Um, not all the endorphins fall in this category to get technical, but most of them do. So again, it's well known, just as it's well known with SSRIs, it's well known for people who chronically take opiates that their um, sexual desire goes down the toilet. That's usually the only time that that would be an issue because endorphins are usually temporary. And in fact, endorphins go up with sexual activity, with sexual desire. Um, but my, so I'm not saying that uh, endorphins always kill sex drive, but I'm saying that when they're chronically raised, that generally, that and the serotonin, so chronically raised serotonin, chronically raised endorphins tends to um, correspond with a emotionally disassociated state where people feel, as you say, numb, shut down, not fully present engaged in the world and so that kind of numb which we also call the dorsal vagal state based on the polyvagal understanding of uh, the nervous system and so when you're in that kind of shutdown state you have less drive in general and that absolutely includes sex drive All right okay so we've got prolactin serotonin and endorphins is there anything else on that list no so just to say none of those are traditional stress chemicals and they're not raising heart rate and all of that kind of stuff but they're all consequence of stress chemicals. They're all ways that your body tries to cope with stress, either very acute stress 
or chronic stress. So I do relate them all to stress ultimately. Well, those are great lists, Owen. Is there, are there any tests out there that can help people determine whether, you know, what is causing their low libido or their lack of sex drive? Uh, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so out of the ones I listed there, some of them are easy to test. All of them are possible to test, but some of them are quite difficult. So I would look at testing testosterone and estrogen at least. DHT, if you can, but often it's a lot more expensive. It's like an add-on test. So I would say if your testosterone is low and especially low, really if you're a man or a woman, it's low for you, for what it should be for your gender, then I wouldn't bother testing DHT because, you know, it's extremely unlikely you have low testosterone and high DHT. If your testosterone is high and you still have fairly low drive, then you could consider testing for DHT to see if the problem might be that you're not doing that conversion. You could also consider, am I purposely taking drugs which stop that conversion from happening? Um, uh, and, you know, finasteride and those kind of hair loss drugs would be a common example of that. Um, ditto for some prostate drugs as well. So that's something to be aware of. If you're on certain medication, look at the side effects. Yeah, we're not saying to not take them. Obviously, that's a decision for you and your doctor, but it's awareness that low sex drive is definitely a side effect for drugs that lower testosterone and more for drugs that lower DHT. So just be aware of that. Uh, in terms of testing, oxytocin, unfortunately, is not something that can be tested very easily and so is usually not tested. Um, a way of testing oxytocin, I would say, is uh, actually getting some oxytocin and like a nasal spray is not super easy to get. Um, but if you have a good doctor, uh, like a bioidentical hormones private doctor, probably not a normal doctor, um, and you say that, you know, you would like to uh, get some oxytocin, they may be happy to provide that for you. And then you can try it and see how you feel. If all you feel is kind of like an unpleasant, my heart, is you know rate is going up and i feel a little bit flushed and i'm not really enjoying this then that's probably because you don't need any oxytocin you've really got enough and it's just giving you more than you need um but if it feels like oh my god this is really amazing this is exactly what i've been missing then that's more of a sign that you know maybe it was low another thing you can do for that is to look at your genetics so i've seen that I, I don't commonly see low oxytocin in the uh, genetic insights reports, but when I do, it always seems to be coupled with someone who is um, A, a workaholic, and B, an addict. <laughs> um, they seem to, you know, have real problems relaxing. Um, they, they're not necessarily, like, very isolated or anything. They often do have lots of relationships, um, so I don't think it necessarily stops them connecting, but I, what I experience is it stops them being able to ever relax and enjoy stuff like they're they're always on the go or they're always trying to fill a kind of emptiness inside themselves okay and then any other tests specifically so estrogen is something that you can test as well as i said uh you were certainly not trying to get that high but if it's very very low like bottom of the range or even lower then that could be something that's going on that's more important for women than men um but it is important for both now we said dopamine is the number one driver of desire Dopamine is hard to test, but prolactin, I wouldn't call it easy to test, but, you know, uh, there's a test that I do, and I know you've done, Chrissy, that is like 50 different markers for about $200 that includes prolactin. So it's not really expensive. Whereas DHT, it's like, at least in my, you know, area, it's like $100 just for one marker. Prolactin is not necessarily that. So if you can get prolactin, it, at least occasionally, it's a really good one. Because as far as I know, it is the best indicator of that dopamine status. So um, if prolactin is high, you can bet that your dopamine, if not low, it's certainly not also high. Maybe it's mid-range at most. And so you know that that could be a potential issue. Serotonin is a tricky one to test as well. You can test the, um, the byproduct metabol uh, metabolite, but I don't believe that that's 100% um, reliable and again endorphins isn't really something so yeah i would really limit it to um the hormones estrogen t prolactin and if you can dht right okay yeah great starting point and if all those numbers look good then there is worth investigation into those other ones that may be a little bit more not as easy to do but worth having a look and you can do uh you know our genetic i think we have a genetic reports for we have a genetic report for all of those except for endorphins i think so you can see if you have a genetic tendency 
um, you know, testosterone, uh, estrogen, uh, oxytocin, dopamine. You can see if you have a genetic tendency for all of them. In my experience, if you have that genetic tendency, like to low dopamine or hyperlactin or whatever, um, you're probably actually going to have it. Like, I don't think I've ever seen someone who has a genetic tendency to have something high and then have it be chronically low in real life or vice versa. At most, there'll be a mild deviation from that. So the genetics are actually really helpful with this, especially with those things that you can't easily test directly. Very good point. Very good point. And then earlier I talked about if there's a difference in what causes the low libido, low sex drive between men and women. Is there a difference? Are there things that we should be looking at differently for them? Yeah, so definitely. But it's more a matter of degrees than fundamentally you know, being different. So if I just go through the list again, dopamine is super important for both sexes. Oxytocin is con generally considered to be more important for women. So it's the idea if I don't feel comfortable with him, I, if I don't feel safe for him, if I don't feel connected with him, then I don't have a, you know, a sexual urge with him. Um, or her. Um, estrogen is also more true for women, but as I mentioned, it's still also true for men with the the uh, stat about uh, erectile dysfunction also showing up when men have very low uh, estrogen, but it's especially important for women. Um, testosterone is obviously especially important for men, but it's also important for women. DHT is especially important for men, but it's also important for women. Um, prolactin is really both. Uh, serotonin and endorphins is also really both so just in terms of i, I realize that there are very different reasons on a you know a human level but on a biochemical level they're not really that different it's just a matter of uh, degrees all right so yeah maybe it's it's higher for one or higher for the other and some somebody else but those are the all of the main ingredients that we're really looking at to determine whether our libido is high or low yeah I hope you're enjoying this episode. I just need to take a moment to quickly tell you about a way that you can support the podcast by getting high quality, affordable supplements that Elwin and I personally use, and that's Feel Younger. What I love about Feel Younger is they have great quality products with minimal fillers, but the prices are very affordable. You can call their customer support team 20 hours a day, seven days a week, and in my experience, they're really helpful and friendly. And what I love most of all is the amazing descriptions Elwin's written for each product category about that topic. There's so much information and education on it. I've actually learned more from reading their product descriptions than I have for most articles. So to support the podcast, please use Feel Younger for all your supplement needs. And to let them know we sent you, you can use promo code rejuvenateme for a 20% discount off your first order at feelyounger.net. That's 20% off your first order with promo code rejuvenateme at feelyounger.net. We've discussed the biochemical part of it, but there's that physical act, especially for men that, you know, it really, you know, can, and so when that libido is low, when those hormones or the neurochemicals are low and, you know, that's interfering with a, a person's ability to have sex, you know, what do we do then? Let me just speak to women first, because that's maybe a little bit easier to address. So for women, it's mainly, you know, vaginal dryness, lack of lubrication, um, and that usually does come down to estrogen now the tricky thing with that of course is that estrogen is not great for you um and also that you don't want estrogen to be high in relation to other important hormones like progesterone so i would not recommend to women who have that issue to, to just get some estrogen because you could be making a bad problem worse but with the right support um often getting the right amount of progesterone Getting, which is, an, you know, your, as a woman, it's your primary anti-stress chemical. Um, and it's significant for men as well, but especially for women. Men also have uh, DHT as an anti-stress chemical, very powerful. Um, women have a lot less of that. So women rely more on progesterone to be their anti-stress chemical. So making sure you have enough of that, making sure you have a bit of a testosterone, enough of testosterone to give you that drive. Um, and then I believe bioidentical hormone doctors often recommend a like a uh, vaginal uh, cream of uh, estrone which is the least problematic of the most common types of uh, estrogen so that's often what they recommend and that works for that issue um, for women being able to perform for men being able to perform um, yeah it, it could be more challenging so and it's more common 
So generally, and this is obviously cliche and there are many exceptions, but generally the issue when it comes to whether they have sex or not, if they want to intellectually, you know, in their mind they want to, the thing that will stop a woman is lack of just desire in her body. And the thing that will stop a man is lack of ability to get hard. That's really, and as I said, both can sometimes experience both, but that's kind of the common cliche. Um, so for women, I do think that um, things like dopamine and also oxytocin. So oxytocin doesn't necessarily only mean taking oxytocin. It could be activities that relate to oxytocin, you know? So relaxing together, connecting together, feeling like you have a bond and, you know, feeling safe and, uh, feeling like you love each other, all of that kind of stuff. Important for both sexes, but especially important for women. Um, but important for men too. I think men underplay the uh, importance of that. And, it, you know, it does vary a little bit. So the way I look at it with men, there's, and as I said, this is something I've a lot of uh, experience with, having had many, many, many um, uh, customers for the business over the years that's focused on this is that there's three fundamental issues. Although lack of sex drive does happen, especially with, as we talked about porn addiction and stuff like that, um, it's usually the physical thing that gets them first. <laughs> um, and so the physical thing can be caused by one of three things, usually in my experience. Number one is a physical blockage. So this is a circulation problem. Number two is uh, stress. Now, so this could be biochemical, but um it may also be uh psychological and then number three is a lack of drive as i say that tends to be like the third on the list so if when a man can never get hard or never get fully hard the first thing to look at usually would be circulation when a man is more like like he can get hard uh you know with one woman but not another or he can get hard on his own, but not with his wife, or whatever, then we look, that's more of a stress thing going on, that may be to do with oxytocin or other stuff. Um, and then when, you know, he feels desire for, uh, you know, women who are not his partner, but not his partner, <laughs> something like that, then, you know, there is that thing with men of... Um, as a kind of cliche that they feel more desire for newness. Now, there is obviously truth to that, but I would say that would be counterbalanced, you know, what the kind of traditional conservative, whatever you want to call it, people say about how the best sex you can have is with a loving long-term relationship it is also true, but it depends if with that long-term partner you have that genuine deep connection and trust and intimacy that really creates a lot of oxytocin, that experience is going to be better than the feeling of excitement, but without oxytocin, there's someone you can bring. But unfortunately, a lot of people don't have that for various reasons. And so then, if you don't really have that oxytocin connection with your long-term partner, then or you don't have enough of it, then someone new or different can seem more desirable because there's more excitement. There's more actually not great chemicals like noradrenaline, PEA, phenyl, ethyl, amine, the stuff that's in chocolate as well, which is an endorphin, which gives that kind of excited kind of feeling, all the rest of it. So, um, so yeah, those are a few different factors. So let's start with the just can't get hard at all. So that's a circulatory issue. That's almost certainly a buildup of plaque in the uh, vessels of the penis it could be and it almost certainly is a buildup of plaque in the vessels in general and the arteries and the capillaries and all the rest of it and that should be treated in a systemic way i won't go into detail about how you deal with that because we have a full episode in that um about how to uh, address cardiovascular health my perspective on what creates that arterial plaque is well, it's not different from mainstream medicine because mainstream medicine doesn't really explain what causes it. Uh, well, they blame it on like cholesterol from food, but that's been discredited these days. So they don't really get it generally. So my perspective on that in a nutshell is that it's caused by kind of toxins that are not commonly recognized and that to deal with it, you need to clean up the plaque 
and you need to clean up the inflammation and you need to deal with the toxins that are underlying it. That's it in a nutshell for episode uh, two. Actually get a proper break down on what to do about that. It'll be in the in the uh, description for sure. Okay, so yeah, so that buildup of plaque that really needs to be treated, no matter what, just you, even though you, you're not able to perform sexually, but there's a whole bunch of other potential health issues that you really need to address if that isn't occurring. Absolutely. It's an early warning sign. They say the thing about heart disease, that it's a silent killer. The reason it's the silent killer is because there is often very little symptoms until it's very far advanced, and often there's no symptoms. This is why people, or at least nothing that the person notices, which is why a person can go around feeling great and then suddenly they have a heart attack. They're like, oh, where did that come from? Because there's so many other diseases, including ones that I've had, that like you feel terrible, but then you go to a doctor and they're like, ah, there's nothing wrong with you. It's nothing major. You know, it's just gas. It's just whatever. It's nothing. It's just a bit of inflammation. Whereas this is the exact opposite. You could be like almost about to die and think you're totally fine. Um, so one of the early warning signs of that heart disease is erectile dysfunction. Um, generally, it's the extremities that suffer from the lack of um, circulation first. So the brain is an extremity. So this is where we slowly don't think as clearly. You know, the feet and the hands, like the fingers and the toes are extremities. But it very easily could show up in the penis and for many men it does that's the first place it shows up i wanted to ask about you know getting morning wood because you know you'll i'll see people that you know and they're they're young yeah pretty much every morning and then that just declines 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 so would you say that that's a massive indicator of health as well making you know if you're waking up with that morning wood every day or whether you're maybe not at all i think there's two factors that, to that one of them that's commonly talked about and one that isn't um so yeah one of the reasons why you have that is absolutely because you know you get this uh pulsing of all kinds of hormones and during the night you have a pulsing of different hormones and so if you sleep through the night you have a good night's sleep you get a pulse of cortisol to wake you up in the morning but you also get a pulse of dopamine and you know among other things you get a pulse of testosterone and so that gives you that feeling of drive and desire straight away what you'll notice is if you're the kind of person who the alarm clock rings you're like pulling the covers over, oh, God, no, I don't want to face the day. Uh, like, you're probably also not getting morning wood. If you're the kind of person who wakes up like, ding, ah, okay, you know, what do I get to do today? What am I going to achieve? Da, da, da. You're much more likely to get morning wood. So my point is the sexual desire goes along with the desire in general, and the lack of sexual desire goes <laughs> along with the lack of uh, desire in general. Another factor of it, though, and one other reason why I think that it becomes less common as you get older is due to how many times you get up at night to go to the toilet. So men tend to do that more often um, as they get older than women. Both men and women are more likely to get up and go to the toilet at night when they're 60 than 20. But men are more likely to do it more than women because they have uh, developed, the prostate tends to grow like on, <laughs> on an ongoing basis throughout your entire life. So um, as the prostate gets bigger, you tend to have that issue more and more. So anyway, if you're getting up to urinate, you know, even three or four times a night, let alone, you know, 10 to 12 or something like some men go through eventually when they're 60 or 80 or whatever. Uh, but even if it's, say, one or two, it means that you're not as likely to wake up with full bladder. So one of the things that your body does is it makes you have an erection to stop you peeing, to stop you peeing yourself, to stop you peeing in the bed. Um, it's very, very difficult to pee if you have uh, a full erection. So I think that is actually another factor as to why. I mean, I, I still get them and they're just annoying because I go to the toilet and it's like, it's difficult to pee. <laughs> but I understand that's that's why my body did it in the first place to stop me peeing in the bed without waking me up, right? Because the other option would be to wake me up. Um, I believe that the research shows that like a healthy vital man, again, they actually have erections throughout the night. I think it's goes along with that pulse like every 90 to 120 minutes or something like that um as the body cycles through the different uh brainwave um frequencies as you sleep and so uh yeah but i think that the erection comes with the most wakeful part of that cycle of brainwaves and so i think it 
uh, stops you from potentially peeing yourself. That's the thing. <laughs> it's not much talked about. Uh, <laughs> but but it still wouldn't be possible without the, the dopamine and the testosterone and all the rest of it. That's still primary. Okay, so physical blockage, circulation, build up a plaque. Go check out our episode on cardio health. Um, then you mentioned stress. Yes. Um, so this is more like performance anxiety or stuff like that. So as I said, there's kind of two aspects to this. Um, there's the kind of stress where a person has chronic stress. And so then the only time they can get hard is if they feel really relaxed and really comfortable. And then unfortunately for many men, the only time that's going to happen is when they're on their own or when, uh, um, you know, and, and it would be better if it was when they're with their partner. But unfortunately, it's not because very simply, you know, men feel pressure to please their partner. And so it's, what's the word, um, self-sabotaging. But unfortunately... Catch-22, yeah. yeah. If you care about being able to get hard because you don't want to let your partner down, then that creates anxiety, performance anxiety. That means that then you can't get hard. Whereas if you're on your own, there's no one who cares if you get hard or not. And so there's no pressure and then you're more likely to be able to do it. So that is the problem with it, um, as I understand. So if a person, so that's really high chronic stress. That's what I'm talking about. So if that person can reduce their baseline level of stress, so reduce their cortisol and adrenaline and noradrenaline and all the rest, that will reduce their prolactin. As their prolactin will go down, their dopamine will go up, and then their desire will override their stress, right? Because you might still be nervous about, you know, am I going to let my partner down? Am I going to come too quickly? That's another thing that men have to deal with, you know, or am I not going to be able to get hard? It's like, it's a bit of a tightrope for us men, <laughs> to be honest, if you're not in peak shape, because it's like, on one hand, you know, I'm not going to be able to, on the other hand, I'm going to go too soon. And, oh, God, you know, so... um I realize women have their own challenges around it, but I'm just saying that's what it is for men. And so uh, you have to be fairly relaxed to be able to do that. And so that's why a, lo a low-ish at least level of prolactin and a good high level or high-ish at least of DHT. So DHT increases dopamine, which we've really talked about, and testosterone does, but especially DHT. But another thing DHT increases, which we haven't really talked about, is GABA. So GABA is your primary calming, relaxing neurotransmitter. And so I would say a lack of GABA, either through lack of T and DHT or just in general, is, an, is the kind of cause, if you will, of erectile dysfunction in that case. If a person could relax, if they felt as comfortable or more comfortable with their partner as they do on their own, um, and if they felt comfortable enough with their partner then they would prefer being with their partner than seeking someone new either in real life or you know watching videos or whatever you know it's all seeking newness so if the feeling of being relaxed and connected trumped the novelty so feeling relaxed and connected is oxytocin dopamine is stimulated by novelty so it's funny, dopamine is stimulated by desire, so things we want, but dopamine is also stimulated just by newness. And that's not just true for sexual partners, but that's actually true of everything. So uh, we have this desire for novelty. This is, you know, like about social media, like the constant notifications and people scrolling through posts, scrolling through videos. It's not that the next, the, the reason why people are... Um, compelled to look at you know swipe and look at yet another video is not because they are convinced the next video will be necessarily better than the one that they're currently on it's because it's new and therefore exciting right so actually we all have this men have it more with sexual partners probably but we all have that we want newness because it stimulates dopamine and it's exciting um and so yeah ultimately to get rid of that stress issue with a partner, which is usually where it shows up most, it would be, you know, increasing that oxytocin between you, which could be down to um, all kinds of deep stuff about, you know, intimacy. A lot, you know, that word is thrown around a lot, but and it's even used as a euphemism of sex. But my understanding is that it's 
like a profound level of honesty. So you're not holding anything back, both intellectually in terms of how you're feeling. You're just like, to some degree, you can't just go around telling everyone every single thing that's going on inside you and all the rest of it, right? That's not appropriate. Some people may laugh at you. They may take advantage. They may judge you and all the rest of it. That's normal. No one's saying you have to walk around with your heart on your sleeve everywhere, but there should be some people who you can be honest with. And so that's really what how I would define intimacy. And I believe that's the correct definition of intimacy from a psychological point of view. So if you have that, you're going to feel really relaxed around that person because they're one of the only people you can be 100% honest with. You can be 100% yourself with without fearing, you know, judgment and condemnation and all the rest of it. And then you can have the experience of actually feeling more relaxed with them <laughs> than if you're on your own. And, you know, more connected and therefore also excited. So to say that oxytocin, if you're adding it to dopamine, is much better than either of them on their own. So in terms of stress... Yes, I mean, do all the stuff to reduce stress that everyone talks about of sleeping more and, you know, maybe trying magnesium and ashwagandha and B vitamins and meditation and breath work and all the rest of it. But also in the specific context of sex, it would also be oxytocin stimulating in general and then specifically with your sexual partner. Hearing what you're just saying there too, that GABA is playing a major role in, in that being in that calm state, which is very necessary. Okay, yes. So, so, so yeah, just to make that distinction between GABA and oxytocin. So GABA is just like peaceful, whereas oxytocin is like loving, connected. So they're both a kind of relaxed state because you can't be loving and connected if you're tense and fearful. But oxytocin is kind of calm but also excited, whereas GABA is just calm if that makes sense. So Gabba is just like pure, everything just come down, like relaxed, centered, zen, peace. It's, you know, Valium, Xanax, Benzo is that kind of like, it just kills all anxiety, all stimulation when it's very, very high. Um, oxytocin, there is still a little bit of stimulation, but it's it has no trace of fear. I guess that's the distinction and no trace of anger and irritation and all the rest of it. It's, it's a purely positive, mild stimulation is oxytocin. So then also what I'm hearing is for the ability for a man to get an erection, he's got to be in a calm state. So that stress isn't going to a degree. To a degree, yeah. If he's too calm, then he won't be excited. <laughs> <laughs> but if he's too tense and stressed, it also isn't going to happen. Yeah, it's a little bit of a tightrope. <laughs> and again, not a big deal, right? You know, when you were 15 as a man, if you're watching this, it was, you know, you managed it. Um, but you know, that's kind of the point, right? You had the right, uh, uh, chemical combination back then. I mean, as a teenager, you often do feel a lot of anxiety, which may seem to contradict what I'm saying and yet still be able to get easily get hard. But the point is the desire overrides the anxiety, right? That's what it is. That's why you can usually still get hard as a teen when you're a, a boy, even if you're also very anxious about this, that, or the other. Um, usually it's because you have so much desire, so much testosterone, so much dopamine. It just, it's, uh, it's just, it cancels it out, it overrides it. But then over time, the stress may get the, be the same, maybe even increase, but the, the dopamine goes down in relation to it. And then suddenly there's not enough excitement anymore to override the tension. And a lot of men try and resolve that by jacking up the excitement. So seeking more new sexual partners, you know, watching more extreme porn or whatever it may be. But what they actually need to do is do the opposite of relaxing and then connecting. Right. Because when we say the desire here, too, we're really talking biochemically with that dopamine aspect because you can want it as much as you want it. But like, hey, stuff's still not working. It's an animal desire. Yeah. Not an intellectual mental desire. That's the key difference. And women have that too, right? Women like, I really want to have sex, but my, you know, I've got no lubrication. Well, that's you do in your head, but your body doesn't. That's the distinction. Perfect. Okay. So then the, the third thing on the list was the lack of drive. Yeah. And I guess we've already covered that, but you know, that could be a lack of testosterone. As I was saying earlier, when you're a teenager, usually, even if you do have anxiety, you don't want to have any arterial plaque yet. But even if you do have a lot of anxiety about being with the opposite sex and, you know, all of that kind of stuff, you can override it through sheer 
magnitude of intense desire. <laughs> and so that is the other thing that you can do is just jack out the desire more and more um, to override the anxiety. Um, and it, you know, in some cases, lack of desire may be it. Obviously way more common now than it was even a few decades ago, because as well as all the other stuff we talked about, I think all the other stuff we talked about so far was probably tr true a thousand years ago, as much as it is today, except for talking about porn, I guess, but that's the only distinction. The other thing that we have these days so much, other than porn, is chemicals everywhere, and specifically estrogenic chemicals that um, will increase the amount of estrogen and then also reduce testosterone. And so... Men have way less testosterone now than they used to. I believe that there's even more of a DHT deficiency epidemic than there was a testosterone epidemic. I see the testosterone epidemic being almost mainstream now. I see some mainstream places talk about how you know severe it is that testosterone is so low for men. I actually think the DHT thing is worse. And I tend to get conspiratorial about it because... So many of the guys that men look up to these days, like your action heroes, you know, or your sports stars or whatever, they tend to be often big guys with big muscles. Most of them are on some kind of steroids, honestly, seems to be the case. Um, and the thing about steroids, the thing about testosterone is, as I said at the beginning, testosterone is very anabolic. It gives you big muscles. It makes you look masculine. But it doesn't actually necessarily make you act masculine, especially if it's not being converted into DHT. So the kind of guy that you saw like 100 years ago who would be risking their life and acting like it was you know no big deal a lot of the time and you know your John Wayne types, you're, you know, unshakable, um, you know, whether it's risking their lives in violent encounters, risking their life with, you know, uh, doing extreme jobs around, you know, a very unsafe work, which a lot of men did throughout the ages, um, and taking it all in your stride and not getting overly upset and not getting overly traumatized. That kind of, I'll take anything that life throws at me and it's not a big deal and I'm cool kind of masculinity, that's really lacking. Right? In this age, we don't lack male role models who have big muscles and probably the ability to punch quite hard, but we definitely do lack male role models who are just like super masculine. Like a you know, like a James Bond was a fictional character, but that kind of thing, right? Where pretty unfazable, not making a big deal about anything, extremely courageous, extremely honest, extremely direct, extremely uh, unflappable, those kind of qualities, you know. These days, we have a lot of men with big muscles, but who um, are quite estrogenized in some ways, who will, you know, not rebel, not be courageous, be afraid to say what they really think, kind of toe the line, not take risks, you know, that kind of stuff. And I think that's because of the focus on testosterone. It's, it's all about looking masculine, not actually acting masculine. And that's one of the, you know, main, probably the only criticism of DHT, which I think is relevant, is that it could make you lose hair. And I say it could, if you have a genetic tendency to male pan baldness and you're not super healthy, it's possible. But and I say to people, so, okay, I, I get that, but would you rather have hair and have low sex drive, high anxiety, high levels of depression, uh, you know, um, erectile dysfunction all these issues and they would say yeah i'd rather have all that than not have my hair and to me that speaks to like the the emasculation of men right that how they look is now more important than them to them than all the other qualities that make you a man and so so yeah, so you have guys, you know, they take stuff to make sure that they take stuff that kills their DHT to keep their hair from falling out. And then they take steroids often to then increase their muscles, make them more anabolic. And I think there's a, there's a definite connection there. I think, um, the demonization of DHT goes hand in hand with the demonization of masculine qualities. And obviously masculine qualities can be demonic, <laughs> Um, if expressed a certain way, I'm not denying that, 
but I'm just saying to believe that they're inherently demonic. I don't think it's coincidence that the same institutions that are pushing the idea that masculinity is inherently bad are the same institutions, basically, that push the idea that DHT is inherently bad. And this is a, a real issue that affects both men and women. Because what do some of the women, you know, what do many women complain about in this day and age? A lack of genuinely masculine men, right? Where are the men who will just come and provide for you and protect you and look after you? And, you know, um, and that, you know, they, they are, where are the men who are confident and ambitious and, and strong, you know, and, and all that kind of stuff, right? Qualities that women tend to find attractive. So basically, no one wins from war well, almost no one wins from this arrangement um women often have to settle for men that they're not truly deeply attracted to and then men have to live with being men <laughs> the women that we are not truly deeply attracted to and so that's often at the root of all this stuff i know i'm getting a little bit deep here for a sec before we go back to uh more you know chemical stuff but i think it it's a big part of it and, and there is a chemical basis for it, as I say. If you're blocking the conversion of testosterone to DHT and or if you're just, you know, filling yourself with estrogenic stuff, whether it's tap water, soy, all that kind of stuff, or if you're reducing your level of testosterone and DHT through chronic stress, all of these things are putting you in that position where your DHT is low. You don't really feel like a confident, like unflappable man and so you have to do all kinds of things to try and compensate for it or to, you know, maybe you're, you become serious, serially um, uh, promiscuous to try and prove what a man you are because of how many women you're with or, you know, you, you put a lot of effort into performing in the bedroom and being, you know, satisfying the woman that you are with maybe in a monogamous relationship, but it's more of a performance than a genuine connection because, again, you're trying to prove something rather than, just being relaxed and confident, which would be a DHT quality again. So <laughs> I do think it's all interconnected. No, absolutely. And again, going back to that thing where we were discussing about stress and in this, you know, the mind field that the brain and the psychology and the other, other thing, everything else that plays along with that, of especially everything that you just did with that deep dive. It's like, I, I can't even imagine that we are all doing what we're doing because it just seems like there's so much. And then, of course, as we've talked about in many other episodes, toxicity, you know, eating things that are really upping that estrogen, everything else. You know, you even think you're eating a healthy diet or all these other kind of things, but it's having a knock on effect on all of these um these hormones and these uh, neurotransmitters and everything that we've just discussed, but you think you're doing a great job, but there are some things that need to be looked at. Okay. And then I'm glad you brought up the, um, you know, taking a pill because this leads me into my next question, because there's a lot of drug companies out there. They've got this, you know, magic little pill. They go to the doctor and the doctor's like, don't worry, just take this and it's going to fix the issue. You know, so one, is that true? And secondly, or are they setting themselves up for a future that they really don't want? Yeah. Well, it was a big revelation in the eighties when, um, Viagra came out. I'm not sure if we'll have to talk about that, but I'll do it. Um, and uh, so what it does is it increases the level of nitric oxide temporarily, but not that temporarily. It does it for quite a few hours. So my understanding of nitric oxide is a bit different from the general mainstream understanding, but it is supported 100% by science. Um, I got it from Ray Pete's work, which we've talked about before. Um, but not just him as well, also through the work of Buteyko, which we've also done an episode on. So my understanding is the thing that you're, the, the gas that is supposed to be your primary vasodilator, and vasodilator means um, open up and reduce constriction of your arteries and capillaries so that the blood can flow more freely through them, is carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide when it is on the high end of the reference range, will lead to vasodilation, will, which will lead to a better circulation, just to simplify it. Most people are stressed, which means that they're over-breathing, which means that they're low in carbon dioxide. 
So that's yet another factor that affects circulation that we didn't talk about. We talked about plaque because that's the easy one to talk about, the physical blockage. But the other element of it as well is this constriction, vasoconstriction. And so that's due to lack of carbon dioxide. So whatever's causing the lack of blood flow, whether it's vasoconstriction, whether it's an actual physical blockage like plaque, what nitric oxide does is it forces the blood flow through by causing, again, vasodilation. But here's the thing. Nitric oxide is good, but it's meant to be temporary. It's like a, a temporary vasodilator that is useful in certain situations. It's useful in emergencies, and it's also useful with sex. So yes, oxytocin, for instance, does increase um, nitric oxide temporarily. And that's not a bad thing because it increases it temporarily, 10, 20, 30, 40 minutes, something like that. But when you're taking Viagra, that increases it more than natural oxytocin would, and it increases it for hours and hours and hours and hours, nitric oxide actually has damaging effects on the circulatory system when it is high for anything other than a short period of time. In fact, it has damaging effect full stop. But it's just if it's temporary, your body will quickly recover. But if it's a lot, then first of all, it's more for your body to recover from. And second of all, your body has less time to recover if you're doing it regularly, as some people are. Let me ask you a quick question, because we have discussed this before, that you know the carbon dioxide is the main system, but the nitric oxide system is more like a backup. And so when we're using that backup constantly, it's having a side effects or detrimental effects that we necessarily don't want, correct? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And this is something you don't have to take my words on. If you just Google, um, you know, negative effect or damaging effects of nitric oxide or something like that, you'll see plenty of evidence for it. It's not clear that it's good or bad. It's both, right? There's loads of research papers about it being good. There's loads of research paper about it being bad. My understanding is it's simply about degree. You know, you don't want it to be excessive. Well, what a drug does is it makes it excessive. Right? It makes it chronically high. Why is it doing it? Because it's having to counteract the other force is stopping the blood flow. So it has to counteract the lack of carbon dioxide and, or usually and, it has to counteract the plaque, which is stopping the blood flowing through, right? So imagine, you know, you've got a tube and then like, I don't know if you can see it on the camera, and then a certain amount of it's blocked and so now it's a thinner tube, right? And so if you open it up, then it's going to go back to maybe what it would have been in the first place, even without the plaque being there. Does that make sense? Yeah. So a, a dilated artery with plaque may be the same as a nor, you know, an undilated artery without plaque, right? So it's getting enough blood flow, but it's forcing it through using a gas which is not meant to be chronically as high as the drug makes it, which is why one of the listed side effects... Um, of those kind of drugs is erectile dysfunction. Like, so you can overdo it and and it can be permanent. I, I've read letters from guys who are like, I haven't been able to get an erection ever since doing it, right? So if you overdo that nitric oxide system, basically, then the body, with everything, we talked about it, a little bit of dopamine before, with anything, if you try and push it too far in one direction, your body will compensate and go back to, you know, in a different direction. So that nitric oxide system can also stop working properly if you're overstimulating it. So I would say it's very dangerous, the list of those drugs. I personally have never used them. I know some people in my kind of biohacking longevity community sometimes use very low dosages to increase blood flow and reduce blood pressure. I, f I understand why they're doing it because they're not aware of the damaging effects of nitric oxide. And overall, it's better to not have high blood pressure. So I can see why someone thinks it's worth doing it to not have high blood pressure because it's true high blood pressure is a really big risk factor. But it's like it's replacing something really bad with something pretty bad. And I would suggest it's much smarter to clear away the plaque, increase carbon dioxide, um, rather than forcing that nitric oxide to be high. The other drug that you know we've talked about uh, already is finasteride and the other drugs that are DHT blockers. Um, those drugs will absolutely kill sex drive. Uh, SSRIs, those drugs will kill sex drive for reasons we talked about earlier. Um, cortisol or cortisone, you know, that will kill sex drive because th so, um, the, you know, the non anabolic steroids, right? The steroids that they give you for inflammation and stuff, that's often it's uh, cortisol 
which is still their stress chemical, which will still raise the prolactin and reduce the dopamine and all the rest of it. Um, opiates we talked about, those will kill sex, sex drive. And those are just the drugs that kill sex drive directly, let alone all the ones that kill it indirectly by just reducing health in general, which then, uh, or increasing stress in general, which has that knock on effect. But yeah, just for the mechanisms we already talked about, there's a lot of people on those drugs that are going to reduce um, either sex drive or the ability to get hard or both. There are some drugs that, you know, are interesting um, that are classified as drugs. Oxytocin is one of them. You know, oxytocin increases that nit nitric oxide in a safe way. Uh, you know, not an excessive level and not for so long, but it does increase it. So that can help with uh, both sexual desire and also ability to get an erection. Um, there is also PT141. So that's a peptide, which is a part of a longer peptide. Um, and uh, the longer peptide being melanotan, which is often sold for tanning. Uh, but there's a piece of that peptide called PT141, which is specifically for including increasing sex drive. Um, that peptide is actually registered. I can't remember the name off the top of my head, but it's actually registered in the US by the FDA, with the FDA, um, for treatment of uh, female hyposexual syndrome, something like that. So basically, women of low sex drive. Um, so either PT141 or just melanotan as well, because it does have that property within it. Uh, they are peptides that can increase sex drive, which may actually be okay, which may not have any sex, uh, negative side effects. I say may because it really depends on your system. So th all of those I just mentioned, PT141, melanotan, they kind of come from alpha MSH, uh, alpha melanocyte stimulating hormone, which is kind of one of the um, upstream chemicals. If you're someone who has um, low energy, high appetite, low sex drive, then those chemicals and their byproducts like PT141 are probably good, beneficial because they're balancing. But if you're someone who has low appetite, high stress, um, and high sex drive, then taking those things will imbalance you even more. So I don't think they're universally safe, but to the people they're marketed to, which tends to be people who are overweight and low in sex drive and stuff like that, generally I'd say that that's a, a pretty safe option. I think the only reason that hasn't really caught on, because you'd be like, oh, wow, increased sex drive for women, great, you know, that should be a billion dollar business, and maybe it is, but the reason why everyone isn't doing it, like they did with Viagra, like where suddenly everyone was taking it pretty much beyond the certain age, it's because you have to inject it. So <laughs> um, a lot of people don't want to do that or they don't want to do it regularly. Um, so that is the reason I believe why it hasn't caught on with that level of popularity. Um, oh, well, yeah, and then another class of drugs, I guess, is estrogen, right? Which is frequently given. So HRT, um, birth control pills, uh, which either contain estrogen or progesterone but not bioidentical progesterone like an artificial progesterone um or both so any birth control will absolutely also uh, yeah i can't believe i missed that but anyway any of those birth control pills can absolutely also reduce sex drives that's yet another category of drugs so going back to you know those pharmaceuticals then you know what we're hearing is that there's a lot of side effects especially that people one are not aware of because i do believe that that is another big aspect of, again, what we're trying to bring here through this podcast is education. Because if you're going to your doctor and not saying the doctors are doing anything wrong here, and you're telling them what's going on, they're like, oh, here, do this, take this. But the fact of the matter is, these pharmaceuticals, they do have these side effects. And it, it could have the exact side effect or detrimental effect that you're actually trying to improve. So it's take the power into your own hand, get that education and really delve deeper. I'm not saying to not take any of those drugs. Any of them could be literally saving your life right now. Maybe the only exception to that might be finasteride, which is really <laughs> just for the sake of vanity. But any other drug, it may well be very, very important for you. So it's exactly as you said, Chrissy. It's not that you need to stop. It's just that you need to understand the consequences of having it and to consider you know, whether something else 
I'd ask your doctor, right? Is there something else that would help me with this, but without destroying my sex drive? Because that's important to me. We're going to take a quick break to share with you one of our amazing sponsors, Genetic Insights. What makes Genetic Insights uniquely valuable is that they test over 83 million different variants, which guarantees a 99.7% accuracy on all of their DNA reports. With over 100 reports available, you get comprehensive insights into what your DNA is telling you about how to optimize your health today and in the future. I found reviewing my results to be incredibly accurate and applying some of the recommendations which are personalized to your individual DNA to be extremely helpful for me and my family. I also loved how easy it was to upload my raw DNA data that I already had from previously using Ancestry.com because Genetic Insights supports uploading raw data from all major platforms. To get your health reports, go to geneticinsights.co and get 20% off today by using coupon code rejuvenate. Remember that supporting our sponsors supports our podcast, which allows us to keep sharing this important information with you free of cost. So go get your Genetic Insights health reports by going to geneticinsights.co and use coupon code rejuvenate for 20% off today. I'm glad you brought up birth control because I think, um, you know, this is my next question is really, you know, there are so many pharmaceuticals that we've been exposed to, whether just because it's we've had to take them, uh, whether it's in the uh, food supply or also whether it's in the water supply. And we've been exposed to these over the years. So I wanted to ask what kind of impact does that exposure have on our sex drive, our libido, uh, you know, our sexual health? So any toxin is going to burden the whole body and specifically the liver. And the liver is really the master controller of the hormones. I know we talk a lot about the glands because, you know, like the adrenal glands create adrenal hormones and like the, the testicles or the ovaries create, you know, the sex hormones and all the rest of it. So they're often created in the glands, but the thing that kind of controls the level of the hormones um, is the liver. And so... If the liver is overloaded with dealing with a bunch of toxins that are difficult for it to deal with, then it can let hormones that you don't want to build up, build up, like estrogen, for instance, uh, famously. Another thing is that um, obviously there are those hormones in foods, in the water, not in the air, but yeah, in the food, in the water, and in skincare products, and in things you put on your skin. Uh, in chemicals that you put on your skin. And we're being flooded with them. So there's phytoestrogens. Those are the estrogens that naturally occur in foods, but which we're having a lot more of those foods than we used to. And then there's xenoestrogens, and they're estrogens. Xeno means man-made. So this is all the plastics, for instance. This is the birth control pills, which then... You know, end up in the sewer system, which ends up in the water that we drink and use because and bathe in and then, you know, again, absorb through our skin because the filtration systems that they use are not able to remove these things from um, from our tap water. So, um, again, you could be conspiratorial and say that there is this uh, um, attempt to estrogenize all of us. The impact of that on men is that it de emasculates them and the impact of that on women is that it uh, causes them to be very unhealthy because it and stressed because it negatively impacts that progesterone to estrogen ratio. Yeah, so knowing that, and I think maybe we could refer everybody to our toxicity episode, but would there be anything here that you would say or recommend for people to limit that exposure? Yeah. So in terms of water, uh, I would only drink water that's either from a pure spring, which I realize most people are going to do, um, or properly filtered. A properly filtered means not one of those, you know, Brita filters or something. It means at least reverse osmosis. Ideally, it's kind of like a distilled level of filtering. That's the only thing that really gets all that stuff out. And then distilled water on its own isn't great, but you can add like a little bit of minerals back into it to drink it. Um, and also not to drink water out of plastic containers, uh, especially, um, you know, mo well, really most kinds of plastic containers, the estrogens and other chemicals are going to leach out of the plastic into the water. So drink water from glass containers, 
have it be pure spring water and pure even a lot of spring water is contaminated so it has to be tested to be pure or you know properly filtered water reverse osmosis at least which is you know quite common and fairly cheap and easy to get and ideally even beyond that like uh we got like a purifier which wasn't crazy expensive thing it was a thousand dollars or something which is i know it's not nothing but that's you know many many years of pure water and uh i believe that that's you know a lot of people spend a lot of money on like pure quality foods and supplements and herbs and stuff and then they forget about water so water is really crucial obviously the food you eat um i say animal food is really great for health in as a very generalization there are many types that aren't and the type that specifically isn't is anything that's non-organic factory farmed and all the rest of it it's not ethically good to support the torture and and imprisonment in tiny containers and all the rest of it of animals but more importantly maybe if you don't care about all that in order to keep them in those horrific conditions they have to pump them full of drugs they feed them horrific feeds um and as well as pumping them full of artificial drugs that you don't want in your body their body is also going to be full of natural drugs you don't want because they're having such a horrific life their body is full of stress chemicals and so you're you're consuming all of that um you can't really get away with it karmically you don't have to care about the animal's welfare at all the worse it's being treated you're going to then have every negative consequence of that go into your body if you eat it um or drink its milk or eat its eggs or whatever it's all passed along so care about how the animal's treated just for your own sake even if you don't care about the animal um and of course you know care about the animal um so animal foods are great but make sure they're good quality like i would i eat a non-organic you know vegetable yeah probably i don't consider it such a big deal in most cases but i really do draw the line with uh like non-organic or non 100 grass food depending on what the situation is with uh, animal food because it makes such a difference um animals tend to concentrate nutrition that's why you know the carnivore paleo kind of people talk about how great animal foods are because they're full of nutrients that's true they're also full of toxins if you if they're exposed to them so you've got to be very very careful of that they concentrate everything toxins and nutrients in terms of foods in general um you know just all the usual advice right about not eating processed food and, and uh, you know all, all the usual stuff um and then skincare products products are another big one what you put on your skin um you know co cotton people talk about how wearing cotton clothes is great i agree compared to polyester in a way because polyester doesn't let your skin breathe which means that again your body's building up all these toxins but cotton if you buy normal cotton is saturated with pesticides so i personally don't ever wear cotton unless it's organic or unless it's secondhand like if it's been washed many 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 times then that gets rid of a lot of those pesticides make sure it's washed in you know not extremely toxic washing powder or liquid you know all of that kind of stuff cleaning products around the house you may not do your cleaning whoever does give them the stuff that is the least toxic possible to do the job uh, I think we're kind of in the middle in our household with that. The extreme of it is people who say all you need is like vinegar and baking soda and water and maybe lemon juice or something. I, I believe that they're right. You know, you can get to that level of not using any toxins. Um, and, and I think my wife does the best of that, uh, minimizing anything um, that's not natural. And then skincare products, shampoo, moisturizer, you know, even things that you don't swallow, but you know put in your mouth like toothpaste like a, uh all of that stuff right just don't use it if it's got any ingredient that you wouldn't be willing to swallow yeah exactly i mean there's some really great apps out there oh, i wish i could think of them off the top of my head i don't know if it's like think dirty or things like that you can scan the barcode it can tell you where it is on the scale of good or bad ingredients oh sounds good put put a link on the uh, episode for that, yeah i'll i'll look i'll look to see i'll make sure i got the name right but yeah i'll put that in <laughs> but yeah um but so great yeah so it's cleaning up those things that we can in our environment so that we can you know make sure that the list you gave earlier about the dopamine the oxytocin and the other things that you mentioned to make sure that those are at optimal levels now moving into the space of the psychological aspect of what somebody has to deal with of not being able to perform or not be intimate in the in the physical way 
with their loved one. You know, and th- there's a lot of I don't want to say conflict, but things that can go on in that interpersonal relationship. Let's say if somebody's in a long time relationship, but then also too if somebody's you know out dating and then they have to broach that subject with that person. You know, uh, how can somebody? get beyond that point of either having to have those discussions or, you know, can they fix it or do they just have to accept that, hey, this is how my life is now? This is maybe my bias. I don't know if you disagree with this, Chrissy, which you're welcome to, but my perspective would really be um, that that's not something that you live with and accept. That's something that you resolve. And of course, I'm saying that because I have a high level of confidence that's resolvable. Now, obviously, that's from my perspective and my peer group as a 40-ish year old man. Obviously, if you're maybe in your 80s or older, and I've absolutely had, you know, letters, emails from people in that age range who have had, you know, very severe medical issues. And they have got to a point maybe where not where it's impossible, but it is extremely difficult to resolve. And sometimes, you know, I say to them, given all the medical interventions you had and all the drugs you have to keep take to stay alive and all the rest of it, I'm not sure if I can help, you know? So I'm, I'm saying that on purpose just to say, if you can't relate to that description I just made at all, you're probably fine. You're going to be able to resolve it. And I'd focus on resolving it. If you're in that position, then it's tricky. But I would say, you know, if you're that old, generally the, your partner's going to be quite understanding. You know, it's not going to be that unusual. Um, whereas you're, if you're a 35 year old saying to, you know, your wife or husband, or as you say, even a first date or whatever, that, you know, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do this physically. Um, they're going to say, well, why not? You know, they are more likely to make it about them. Right. Whereas if you're an 85 year old saying it, they're going to be like, uh, well, that's disappointing or whatever, but I'm not totally shocked. Right. So <laughs> there is a little bit of that, right? Like, uh, accept the reality of your situation. Now, I've used age there as the obvious one, but even if you're 40, but you've had this massive list of medical challenges, life-threatening stuff, catalog of drugs and all the rest of it, even then, you know, it's it's understandable, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, it is potentially very disappointing for the other person. Um, this is going outside my wheelhouse a bit. Obviously, I'm more the health person, but you know, one of the things that I would say is um, it's always possible to connect with someone and it's always possible to pleasure the other person, no matter what you've got going on with yourself. So um, that's the other thing. I think a lot of people do get very focused on, you know, them and they forget. Yes, your partner cares about your pleasure, but they're not going to feel, you know, horrifically bad so long as they're still being satisfied so um also you know be aware of that like don't get in your own head too much and don't overestimate how important you being able to do this is and then if there is a psychological appointment uh, component to it then relieving that pressure on yourself will often actually resolve the problem if it's not psychological if it's not stress-based as we talked about but it is purely physical um then that's still not going to resolve things in the moment. But if you just have that kind of accepting attitude, I think this is what you were getting at, Chrissy. With that acceptance comes gather and comes, you know, reduce stress. And that helps to put a positive cycle. I really don't feel if your age is 40, 50, even 60, possibly 70, that any of these things are insurmountable unless you've had severe medical issues and procedures and drugs for a very long time. Like, Put it this way, it's very rare that I'm contacted by someone who is under the age of 65, who it's not resolvable. It, it, you know, it, it pretty much never happens. It's extremely rare. So, and yet I met, meet, listen to, hear from loads of people who are on the age of 65 who believe that it's impossible because of the experience that they've had so far. So it is doable. The challenge is often it involves um, more change than the person wants. You know, like usually what they want is to take a pill and for it to go away. And sometimes that's possible. You know, we sell supplements with that one business and they work for a lot of men. Uh, But we also warn 
you know, that um, lifestyle changes may be required. And even if they're not required, they would help a lot. <laughs> so, yes, certain drugs, you know, uh, certain nutrients, certain hormones, certain herbs, etc., can shift those chemicals that we started off talking about, right? Testosterone, dopamine, prolactin, etc. They can shift them significantly and make you have a very different experience. So, yes, that can absolutely happen. Um, but it's not guaranteed. What is guaranteed, as I said, except for in those extreme cases, is if you really address the underlying stuff that we've talked about, then it will get better. And not only that will get better, but everything will get better. Like, a lot of men, especially, this is way less common in women. This is a, this is a type of stupidity that, honestly, I see way, way more in men. They'll contact you and they'll be like, I have erectile dysfunction, but otherwise I'm perfectly healthy. And I'm like, no, so you're not. <laughs> like, that's not possible. That's um, a symptom. <laughs> <laughs> and and it's, it's, it's not extremely far along the path of illness, but it's not the first step, which is what they think, right? That's quite a few steps along. You've already, you know, well, as, you, as we talked about, either your stress is so bad that it's chronic, that it's got to this point, that it's, you know, maybe vasoconstricting the blood flow, or your testosterone has got so bad that you just don't have the desire, or your circulation, you know, has got so blocked to an arterial plaque that it, the blood flow is not going through. But whether, whichever one it is, or you use this combination, like all of those are fairly far along the path. It's just the first thing that you have noticed that you care about in the case of MIT. Um, and so I would encourage you, if you have this issue, not only to accept it as a man, not only to accept it, but actually see it as an opportunity and realize that um, the, the older you get, the harder it is to change your ways. So if you having this, especially, I know probably the average age of the viewers of this, listeners of this, I think are in their 40s um, from what I've seen of demographic information. So, you know, if you are around that age or younger and this issue is happening to you rejoice it means that you have an opportunity to change your ways before you're so set in your ways that it's impossible for you to change and you can end up being a completely different person um you can end up having you know such a good level of t and dht that you're more confident than you could even imagine you might have so such a great level of oxytocin and you can experience level of you know connection and and union and comfort with someone that you can't even imagine. You might have such a level of GABA that you experience a level of relaxation, of peace of mind that you can't even imagine. Like these are all very real possibilities. And because our society is so dysfunctional and our health is so bad, like chronic health issues are so common now, that even being an average level of health 100 years ago, most people can't imagine what it's like because they're so unhealthy with chronic diseases. Now, 100 years ago, we had different issues. We had more infectious diseases and more infant mortality and stuff. Um, but uh, hormonally, we're healthier, is my understanding of it, we used, which means we used to feel better, even if you know we had all these other issues because we were in you know, world wars or coal mines or whatever. But we felt better. <laughs> like <laughs> We weren't depressed and anxious and suicidal and all the rest of it, you know, anywhere near as much. And we didn't have erectile dysfunction anywhere near as often. We didn't have sexual dysfunction anywhere near as often. We didn't have infertility anywhere near as often. And so no one's saying that this advice is going to turn you into Superman or Superwoman, but it just being what was fairly normal 100 years ago will seem like being a Superman or Superwoman compared to what might be average for you in this day and age. Wonderful. So great points because, you know, looking at it, if somebody is coming up and they do have ED, it's like, ah, that's not just, the, that's not the only thing going on. And I think that is a very, very, very important point that you're bringing to the table here. So it's, it takes more, it takes, you know, introspection looking in, okay, why are th things not working as they should be. So let me ask you this, where does premature ejaculation come into the picture with all of this? Yeah, it's a good question. So it tends to be a little bit more of a young man's problem, but not necessarily. Um, some, you know, fairly often men have both erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation, but the mechanism is different, but there's some overlap, which is why you can have both. 
Um, so we talked about the neurochemicals and hormones of desire and not desire. Let's look at the neurochemicals of um, what it, what makes you come more quickly and more slowly. And actually, everything I'm about to say is true for men and women. The only difference is, of course, men are going to try and reduce the things that excite them overly, whereas women often don't necessarily have to do that because they are much slower to get to excitement on average. So um, the primary thing that increases excitement is actually glutamate. And so glutamate is the primary stimulatory um, amino acid stroke neurochemical in the body. Let me ask you a quick question for a distinction because you're talking about excitement, but earlier we were talking about desire. So when you're referring to excitement, what are you referring to specifically? Another way of putting it might be stimulation. So, you know, desire is like an aspect of stimulation, just like fear is an aspect of stimulation. But what both have in common is that neither are peaceful and neither are lethargic. Do you see what I mean? So desire is like an aspect of stimulation. So I'm saying forget about the type of stimulation, just stimulation full stop, right? So stimulation full stop um, is partly down to the uh, adrenal chemicals. So that's adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol, and dopamine to some degree, which we talked about earlier. Uh, definitely dopamine. But the primary thing is actually glutamate. And so glutamate opposes GABA, which we talked about earlier. And it opposes it, and it also turns into it. Uh, or the other way around, GABA. Glutamate, yeah, glutamate turns into GABA. Um, at, but they can go back and forth through some mechanism. So um, basically, premature ejaculation to me is a function of being overexcited. You know, it's very similar, uh, very simple. That overexcitement can come from too much desire, but never on its own. So it's too much desire plus, and it's like fear anxiety, stimulation is something like that, which turns it into a negative. So testosterone and especially DHT will increase both dopamine and GABA, like we talked about earlier, so that you have desire, but also cool, calm relaxation. So you're not getting overexcited. So what's going on with premature ejaculation is yes, there is excitement. There's almost sorry yes there is desire there's almost certainly some dopamine but the problem is it's dopamine not accompanied by GABA in fact it's dopamine accompanied by its opposites um it's uh it's evil alter ego which is glutamate <laughs> now the word glutamate uh both GABA and glutamate are actually amino acids as well as um neurochemicals and glutamate when you tell people glutamate normally what they think is monosodium glutamate which uh, actually is related. So monosodium glutamate is basically a form of glutamate and it's the thing that they famously add to food to make it um, taste better. But the reason why it makes the food taste better is simply because it stimulates the neurons of the brain, basically because it excites you. Um, and so it excites the brain specifically because the brain controls the nervous system and therefore the whole body. Um, so... Um, excessive use of glutamate in food naturally um, there are certain foods that just have fairly high levels of glutamate like soy famously does um, and then also having it added and it's added to almost all processed foods um, it doesn't usually say MSG but it can say like soy protein vegetable protein natural flavoring yeast extract any of uh, there's like I think almost a hundred different terms, all of which actually mean MSG. And so um, that's pretty common. Now, I'm not saying MSG is the only cause of premature ejaculation, but I am saying I believe that the amount of glutamate in food these days is why there's more premature ejaculation. Helping. Yeah. Now, but the, the main thing that increases glutamate is just overstimulation in general, right? Which comes down to two factors too much stimulation, but also, and probably more importantly, not enough relaxation, right? So how do you switch glutamate to GABA? 
well, you know, taking a few uh, breaths, right? Meditation, uh, yoga, um, going outside and, you know, uh, walking around in nature for a few minutes, getting some sunlight on you, um, you know, uh, listening to calming music, watching calming thing, having a calming conversation, whatever, right? All of that kind of stuff, uh, playing, all of that kind of stuff, all the kind of purposeless activity, calm activity, will switch the glutamate to GABA. But because we're so focused these days on stimulation with social media, media, you know, all the rest of it, and we're focused on production, you know, must do something, sleep is a waste of time, you know, I must, you know, achieve and I must do my to-do list, whatever it may be. And so all of that stimulates more and more glutamate. I think, you know, our ancestors probably used to work hard overall, but the difference is they didn't have the stimulation. Like life was boring for most people throughout most of the time, throughout most of history. You know, you rarely saw a new person. Most people couldn't even read, you know, to read a book. Maybe you told each other stories and, you know, there was no electric lighting. So once it got dark, there's probably not a lot to do, you know. This wasn't much to do for a lot of the time. So we were forced to kind of calibrate and transfer the glutamate back to GABA because the, there was just nothing to stimulate us. Even if we worked hard, even if sometimes there were traumas and there were wars and there was this and that, still a lot of the time life was just boring. The number one thing that we're lacking these days is boredom. You know, there's never a reason to be bored these days. Even me, and you know, you'll identify this as well, Chrissy, you know, when you were a kid, did you used to get bored? right? Because sometimes there was nothing to do, right? Your parents took you something or you have to be hours on the train. There was no iPad. There was no this. There was no, like, you had to shut up. You know, you didn't want to upset the adults. You just, you just had to be bored. We don't have that anymore. I don't have that. I never have to be bored. Children never have to be bored, right? As soon as they don't have stimulation, they start causing trouble and the, the kid, you know, the parents are like, oh, have a sweet, have, a, have an iPad, have a this, you know, anything to shut them up again. Um, so, we're all stimulation addicts these days. And so stimulation, it's not always bad. It's not always adrenaline or adrenaline. Maybe sometimes it's good, stim good as in not fear, but it's all stimulating. So it's all increasing GABA. So we're chronically overstimulated these days by our food and by our lifestyle. Um, and so that- So you just said it, uh, stimulating GABA. Did you mean stimulating glutamate? Uh, stimulating glutamate, yeah, yeah. probably. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so- those are things which increase excitement. So it's the stress chemicals, yes, it's dopamine as well. You don't want to lower dopamine because yes, it will stop premature ejaculation, but it will also stop an erection. It will stop you wanting to have sex, so that kills the whole process. So you don't want to reduce that, but you do want to reduce glutamate. You do want to reduce, reduce adrenaline, noradrenaline, cortisol. Um, you also want to increase GABA, obviously. We've talked about that. Um, hormones that increase GABA, DHT, testosterone, progesterone as well. Both sexes need both. Women more progesterone, men more testosterone and DHT. Um, and then, yeah, for progesterone, your body, in the same way that it makes DHT out of testosterone, it makes something called allopregnanolone out of progesterone. And it's this allopregnanolone, which super specifically is um, actually naturally the most powerful GABA stimulator in the body. Um, and so, yeah, these hormones, these anti-stress hormones, masculine and feminine anti-stress hormones, um, are very, very, very beneficial. And that's why, that's one of the reasons that you, as I said, often see erectile dysfunction and premature ejaculation to get together. I, I believe that happens more if the cause of it is high stress, low testosterone, because the high stress increases the glutamate, reduces the GABA, the low testosterone increases the stress, reduces the GABA. So that's what they um, have in common. If you increase the testosterone, you increase the DHT, then you have the dopamine, but you don't have that excess glutamate, which overstimulates you. All right, so what I'm hearing with the premature ejaculation side of it really is you're wanting to increase our natural anti-stress hormones to help put the body in that calm state where there's enough GABA 
for the whole process to really take place the way you want it to. Absolutely. And it doesn't mean you have to have a boring life. Again, if you look at our ancestors, they would, you know, generally have suffered from this a lot less. And it's because their DHT would have been high. That's really it. Perfect. Oh, and this has been very informative. Thank you. I'm so glad we decided to do this one today. Oh, I just wanted to ask you, are there any final thoughts before we close? Yeah, I think I'd like to do an episode at some point about um, reproduction itself. So, you know, fertility and potency and stuff like that. So if you're interested in that, let us know. Um, I do have products for this. As much as I've told you, you know, major lifestyle change and all the rest of it are beneficial. I have, uh, you know, products that help with all the issues we talked about. So we'll try and remember to link those in the, um, in the description, Chrissy. Um, they've been around for a long time. I formulated all of them myself on my own or, you know, with someone else and they're all, you know, very powerful and effective, but they're not miracle pills that will, oh, you know, undo a lifetime worth of self-abuse. So please also do take all the lifestyle recommendations into account. Again, it depends. If someone has these issues mildly and or hasn't had them for that long, then often just the herbs and the nutrients and stuff will be enough to counteract it. The longer it's been going on, the more severe it is, the more that it's likely going to require some kind of lifestyle interventions as well. And I, you know, nothing that I can provide for you or anyone can provide from you, provide for you will over rye the impacts of certain drugs you know so if you're taking certain drugs like the ones we've listed or really anything that tells you that one of the side effects is low libido or erectile dysfunction or whatever don't think that anything <laughs> that i'm going to provide you or anyone else is going to override that and and if it does override it it's not a good thing like we talked about in the case of viagra it's it's forcing it and that may well create a rebound effect that actually makes it even worse and can even make it you know not work per uh, uh, permanently and that's true for low libido for men and women not just for erectile dysfunction like you can really destroy your your basic drive to reproduce with you know enough artificial intervention a lot of it unintended like we talked about you know you're just trying to deal with inflammation with this steroid you're just trying to whatever deal with hair loss with this dht blocker um but these things have unintended consequences that can be really bad. So the other thing, I guess the final thought would be if this resonates with you, uh, but it's not terrible yet, then that's not a reason to wait until it becomes terrible or really bad or un <laughs> unignorable because the longer you leave it, the harder it is to reverse and it can become impossible to reverse. As I said, especially once you're older and you've been through a lot of medical stuff. So um, deal with it now. Good point. And I think also, too, as you we have mentioned or talked about, there are potentially, you know, some psychological things that are coming up. So that's worth having or getting that looked at, too, with maybe, you know, therapy or other things or, you know, resolving certain issues in that regard that could also be helpful, correct? Yes, I, you're absolutely right. I'm a big fan of that. What I'm also a big fan of, though, is start with the neurochemistry. And I, I'd go to therapy and I said this to my therapist and they agree with me because, you know, it, if you're depressed or if you have low sex drive, um, yes, a therapist can help you in all kinds of ways, but not if the reason is because you've got really low dopamine, you know, like that, they may be able to help you fix the dopamine because they may, you know, encourage you to see life in a new way or change your relationships with people, which in turn reduces your stress, which in turn makes you sleep better, which in turn affects your hormones. So they can help you indirectly sometimes. But the reason why it's not, you know, talk therapy has a fairly low rate of success um, with many issues is because it's a bit haphazard. It's, it's kind of luck whether it creates those biochemical changes or not. Start the biochemistry, and sometimes that isn't enough, as you say, Chrissy. Um, one of the signs of it is like, it, let's say, you know, some something that we've recommended today, you do it and it works, but then you do something else and the problem comes back again. And then you do what we recommend and it works, but then some, it, the problem comes back again. And that would indicate to me it's not really a biochemical problem. It's not a physical problem. It's a psychological problem because you keep creating reasons to have this. And this often happens with, you know, maybe extreme things like a history of sexual abuse. Then you might want to, you know, kill your sex drive unconsciously. You might want to without realizing it so that you don't have to face those issues. Or it may be down to low self-esteem. It may be down to 
uh, you know, trust issues. Like there, there could be a lot of things, which is, as you say, are psychological, which are at the root of this. Um, but I personally, this is my personal experience and belief. It makes sense to start with a physical biochemical. And then if that is enough, great. Or until it's enough, you know, as so long as it's enough, great. But then if it keeps coming back, then, ev you know, even if it comes, keeps coming back for your own sabotage, you know, like you, you realize you keep doing things that are making it worse, then, then seek help, right? Let's say you realize, oh, it's st overstimulation, it's watching too much porn or it's eating too much food of MSG in or whatever. That's great. Just stop doing that. But if um, you find yourself that you keep doing that, even though you know it, causes the problems, then that's where I would seek out therapy. Fantastic, Owen. As always, thank you. And thank you to everyone that has joined us today. We love be you being here. Remember to please leave your comments below. Please hit the like and subscribe button and that bell icon so you don't miss an episode. And we'll see you next time. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that video. You may have noticed I recommended a few different videos in that episode. And one of the ones I recommend is just here if you want to click there. Or another one I recommend is just below if you want to click on that one and watch that next.